reframe conversation series that ACC has been mounting over the last five weeks in partnership with Alfred Herrhaus and Kishalska, Dark Matter Labs, and the Gothenburg Center for Sustainable Development and Peak Urban. We absolutely delighted that you're joining us for the last and uh, thrilling part of this conversation series. And um, what I will briefly do is to just recap what we've covered over the last four weeks. And then uh, when I talk about today, introduce our fantastic panel we've got assembled for you. So in the first conversation, we really established the interdependency between urbanization and macro policies, whether these are economic policies or climate change policies, but it was clear that there was a real opportunity to formulate a specific African response to some of these macro development imperatives through the lens of sustainable urbanization. Within that, having a mayor on the panel, the case was made convincingly that cities have to take the lead. And even though cities are often not empowered to do so, that doesn't prevent them from articulating what this would mean in practice. We ended off the first conversation with uh, the conclusion that infrastructure sits at the crosshatch of urban development and green industrialization. And being a latecomer, if you will, to uh, a modern economic incorporation and having to still embark on a massive process of industrialization on the continent, in particular to deal with a massive expansion of the labor market, thinking of that in the first instance as green industrialization is not a choice. In the second conversation, we moved on to consider the political economy of this opportunity. And some of the agreements that emerged from that conversation was one, politics matter. We can't ignore it. And it is important to understand that no matter how imperfect and problematic our political institutions are, this is what we've got to work with and what we've got to deal with. Secondly, across the formal state, formal government institutions, civil society and the private sector, it is clear that given how in, unequal our cities are, that power is pervasive, but that this is power that has to be understood and has to be engaged. It's not good enough to simply say there's inequality and this is related to differential power relations. It's really about engaging with what that means concretely, practically in our different cities. The final agreement from that conversation was that local governments, again, we return to the theme is key, but particularly local government networks. So whilst we've got this lag in institutional reform to empower local authorities, in the meantime, we can use, if you will, the, uh, the collective power of local governments as an institution across the continent to do some of that leadership work. The last point that emerged from that conversation was that we need a clear and a compelling narrative to explain what is the distinctive growth path available to Africa and most importantly, what's the evidence base that has got to support that. And this question of the evidence base, we'll return to that today. And this is something that Peak Urban in particular, one of our core partners to the series has spent quite a bit of time thinking about. In the third conversation, we got into the meat of the sustainable infrastructure provo provocations. And um, we tried to understand what is the scope and the scale of the infrastructure project pipelines and finance. So we had the head of the urban division of the African Development Bank, along with one of the key Pan-African insurance companies to share with, uh, with us their insights and particularly given their interface with the private sector. And what was striking from that conversation was how far we still have to travel for sustainable infrastructure projects and programs to be a viable component of the system as it exists at the moment. And we've got to remind ourselves that in the last fiscal year, the aggregate investment in infrastructure in Africa, not just urban, but in total, was somewhere in the vicinity of 60 to $70 billion. So this is a very significant uh, amount of money and it is important to understand how do we get shift that conversation or those pipelines to really consider the question of sustainable infrastructure. One of the themes that emerged as a conclusion there was in this point about the regulatory environment. And this is really the sort of deep code that structure the opportunities available for rethinking and remaking our cities. And so today's session is really returns to that theme. And we've asked uh, sort of one of the leading global experts on this topic, 
uh, to share with us his insights. The other important issue that emerged there, which we won't address today, but is important to mark because hopefully in the discussion time, some, some colleagues can return to it, is this capacity deficit or is the gap between the new things that needs to be done, the creation of institutions, the repurposing of institutions, the mainstreaming of alternative approaches to infrastructure and the people who's gonna do that work and the communities that's gonna sustain that. So how do we think about scaling the training opportunities or the training imperatives here? How are we gonna produce the professionals and the activists that is gonna do this work on the ground? The final conversation we had in the series to date was then on civic power, and that was last week, Wednesday. And here, the, and the focus was on societal engagement and the enrollment um, of all stakeholders within a city to generate innovation and responsiveness. A strong theme that emerged across the four cities that we looked at last week was the centrality of youth and using the energy and the vibrancy of youth and particularly popular culture as instruments to build different narratives and different cultures. And what was interesting about that is that this idea of this narrative for the city or the narrative that we require is not just a meta narrative, it's actually a, 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 a confluence of a multiplicity of, 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 of narratives in a minor key. So this is the work of storytelling of production that happens on the ground in these cities through these localized projects, through uh, the radio programming we saw in Port Harcourt, through the community arts festivals we heard about in Nairobi and so forth. And so where we left of that session was then a recognition that citizen power, civic power and social movement activism is not just about protest. It's not, and of course, given what is happening in Lagos in the last couple of days, what we've seen going on in Bangkok, what's happening in Santiago, in Buenos Aires, in um, Bogota, uh, just in the last week in terms of, of the importance of, of protest, of course. It's important to recognize that there's actually a toolbox. There's a whole repertoire that has to be understood and that that repertoire has to be continuously refined to ensure that we are able to figure out what is the best next step. And so this brings us then today where we really want to try and unpack how are we gonna bring innovation into the conversation about the future of African cities, into the conversation about what a post COVID urban agenda might involve and look like. And within that we know based on what we've discussed so far that the evidence base, the data is really important. And this is not just about big data or formal observatories and laboratories. It is also about the kind of citizen science that we see in evidence in Port Harcourt through the case study that Michael shared with us about CMAP and the community mapping that they do. But on the other hand, we also need debate about alternatives and options. That the idea that there's a recipe or a best practice that needs to be pursued, I think we've squarely debunked over the last five weeks. And so how do we keep democratic, vibrant, agonistic, deliberative fora alive? And how can that be connected to questions of practice so that it's not just debate for the sake of debate, but it's really about understanding how to do things differently. So what emerged from that conversation then was the idea of experimentation. And we heard a great um, uh, a case study from the work of uh, Seme City in, um, in Cotonou in Beni, uh, two weeks ago, where they really, if you will, building the plane as they're flying it. They're figuring out how to do this kind of science park, how to build differently, how to respond to the climatic conditions, how to train people, how to get the right kind of artisanal skills to construct differently and so forth, all while they're documenting and researching and understanding. And I think it is that kind of vitality, vibrancy that we're looking for. But this is not a new agenda. And so part of why we've invited Indy Jahar to join us today to share with us his rich, deep and widespread experience um, is because he's really looked at this very, very closely and has been at the center of initiating a whole bunch of these different kinds of experiments. Um, and so the question we want Indy to really focus on today is how do we think about the inherited institutions we have and transforming them so that we can in fact begin to uh, pursue innovation with focus and earnest. 
We've then also invited, secondly, uh, Omar Sully, Silla, who is the acting head of the Africa Division of UN Habitat. He's been in the UN Habitat uh, family for some time. He's got expertise uh, in land reform in particular, but has worked across various divisions and also in certain country programs and brings with us, I think, a rich Francophone experience, which uh, is, of course, very important when we try and have this more synthetic account of what is happening on the continent. Our third panelist today is uh, Mark Swilling. And uh, Mark at the moment um, is, uh, holds, uh, I've asked him to reflect from sort of three institutional positions that he holds. He's uh, the co-director of the Center for Complexity Transi Complex Transitions. Sorry, I keep on uh, messing up the, the title, no. Mark, my apology. At the Complex University of Stellenbosch. Yeah. Yeah, you tell us what it's called. CST is all I know, uh, colonialism of a special type in a previous life um, uh, in, at the University of Stellenbosch. So he's sort of uh, been running academic programs for a long time. He's also on the board of the Development Bank of Southern Africa and in that role has really been central to reorient the focus of DBSA to not just take infrastructure seriously, but sustainability and particularly the urban agenda. And more recently, uh, and I'm pretty sure this is for his sins, he's been enrolled to work with the uh, CEO and the board of ESCOM, uh, one of the key utilities in South Africa to help them navigate their transition um, from a predominantly extractive energy base to uh, a renewables agenda. And then finally, um, we've got Sue Parnell. Uh, uh, Sue um, is, uh, a Again, uh, will speak to us from the perspective of urban research. So of course is an extremely well-known uh, global urbanist. And at the moment she coordinates uh, the academic program for the Peak Urban Coalition that ACC uh, is a part of. Um, Sue is one of the founder members of ACC and still continues to serve on our advisory board and as an emeritus professor. Um, and again, I'm not going to speak to anyone's CVs in great details that will take up the two hours, but we've put everyone's bios on our website and we encourage you to please go and click through and have a sense of just uh, the rich experience that they bring to this process. So without much further ado, um, I'll, let me just finally explain uh, the procedures and then I will hand over to Indy. Um, so we will have Indy speak, and then um, I'm going to ask uh, Omar and Mark to respond, um, and then we will open up for, for, for questions and answers. You're encouraged to please write your questions or comments or reflections in the chat function throughout. Um, and then if you want to raise a question, you can raise your hand during the Q&A, and um, our Zoom moderator, Alma Vivius, will then unmute you and you can pose your question. And then after uh, about a half an hour of Q&A, we will then ask Sue to reflect on both the discussion, but also what she's heard over the course of, of the webinar since uh, the first conversation. Uh, so that's the format for today. And again, welcome. And I just want to extend my heartfelt appreciation to the panelists. They all run incredibly busy lives and we appreciate that you've taken the time. And I think Indy, this is, uh, I think it's your first outing for one of the ACC events. So I'm so delighted and I'm very happy that the constituencies we work with uh, can, can be exposed to your ideas and your work. Thank well, you. firstly, I mean, it's an honor and a privilege. And uh, I suppose I would love to frame this by saying that my knowledge of the continent's conversation about cities is limited. So I don't come at it with kind of great expertise from that perspective. And I, I suppose I look to learn over the next two hours, lots from the conversation. Uh, and secondly, I suppose my contributions come from a uh, currently largely a predominantly kind of European and a sort of um, a South Korean perspective with a little bit of Montreal mixed in. So it's very Northern. Um, so I just wanna put that into very transparent conversation. So there will be a particular perspective, but I hope there's some shared learnings and uh, frameworks to it. I'm just going to switch over to slides for a second and uh, open this up. So uh, Edgar, like you were rightly saying, I suppose the way I'd like to start this conversation, and I think it's just to sort of put us in the mood, and you've done a really solid recap of this, is really, it's worth us just acknowledging the state of the scale of um, 
the transformation we're facing. I mean, I, I think if you look at the scale of the climate change uh, risks and how they're manifesting around the world, I think we're talking about a transition which is both complex but also substantial. And those, those, are, those are happening globally right now. And secondly, actually, when we look at this transition, we must talk about it from a systemic level at a global level that also looks at actually the scale of the biodiversity losses that we're talking about globally are of, of an order. So climate change is a symptom. And I would like to start this conversation by saying, saying that climate change is a symptom of a structural problem. And I think the structural problem is the nature of our governance. Um, our governance thesis has allowed for externalities and spillovers, which have effectively now systemically polluting and destroying human capability to survive in many parts of the world. So there is a really, really critical challenge about reimagining our structural thesis on governance, which I think is no longer fit for purpose if it ever was, and certainly was born of a thesis which was which is maybe uh, well out of date. I mean, it was born from a Western thesis of a or perceiving the world as terror. Uh, terra nullis is an, uh, empty, effectively, from a kind of Western colonial thesis, which allowed for seeing the world in that terra nullis around objects. And the object orientation and the terra nullis um, sort of framework allowed for a particular view on the world and the accumulation of externalities and the colonialization that we've seen. And I think both those theses now become problematic to when they were already problematic, but they're also become now systemically destructive to us as a global as a global civilization. And you know, just to put some numbers on it, the, the humans have wiped out sixty percent of animal populations since the nineteen seventies. I think that's pretty much when all the panelists we were all alive. And in that context, there's also a structural transition going on, which I think is worth us keeping in mind. Certainly, from from the to what I would call sort of the overdeveloped economies or misdeveloped economies, uh, what we're seeing is a massive shift from tangible economy to an intangible economy, and that also has some serious implications for how we see value and where value is being stored. And um, you know, for all the want of value creation in the world around us, what we're seeing is values increasingly be stored in land, and land has become the store of value. And why I think this is important is that when we talk about governance, we need to talk about governance not from the direct sense of where assets accrue value, but also where they spill over value. Again, land has become a really significant component in that. Mm -hmm. And then finally, looking at actually the kind of automation challenges, which I think we're going to see pretty much globally, either directly or indirectly. So if we look at the scale of these kind of transformations, they're going to require us to reimagine many of the things in terms of labor laws and other, other relationships. And it's worth us recognizing in the Engels pause in the first industrial revolution or 1800s to 1840, we saw massive transformation of our relationship with labor and capital. And it was over that 40 year period, um, not only did capital and labor diverge in terms of return on value, but also in 1833 was when the moment when actually the UK uh, compensated all slave owners to abolish slavery. So what we've seen is that reconfiguration of value between human and, and capital value also creates, a, usually creates also a shift in relationship between human capital and human, human laws and human relationships to capital value and government and societal understanding. So I think we're entering a very significant period of transformation between these relationships. And this sits in a large scale structural issue, whether it's nutrition decline, where we're starting to starting to project into significant nutrition decline in terms of our food, food sources, all the way through to the debt crisis in terms of uh, debt structuring around the world, the environmental violence, which is what it needs to be framed like, uh, to, to kind of uh, entrench in quality, which is becoming substantive again. I'm talking very much from the perspective I started with. And, I think, you, so when we talk about these problems, and I think Mark will come in and give us some real uh, sort of world-class support on this, but we also need to talk about the nature of these problems, where the cause and effects are delay, delayed and displaced, where the crisis are cascade, with our, have cascading impacts, and there's no simplistic villain. It's driven by a multitude of actors where many of us are implicated in that story as much as anything else. And the nature of the crisis means that actually our historic policy making model, which is usually relies on a, a single simplistic solution becomes problematic. So many politicians turn around and said they're gonna solve the housing crisis. Uh, certainly in many of the 
many of the overdeveloped economies or misdeveloped economies. And what becomes very clear is that actually the housing crisis is not just a function of let's make more housing, because actually that itself is linked to uh, how we financialize housing all the way through to other things. Certainly in that, in that context, you realize it's a lock, it's a kind of a knot of multiple issues which lock together. And our housing policy is our housing production policy or our departments to focus on housing and planning are merely one component of the systems change required to be able to deal with it. So how do you solve these knots or problems becomes a key functional issue when the simplistic silo models no longer work. And this applies to other things. Obesity, this is a, a map of the drivers of obesity, and you start to see actually multitude of impacts and drivers into that story. Or whether it's you look at sort of children's, uh, children's welfare and care, and you start to realize schools are a very small component of the outcome-driven uh, support required for children. And again, this is some of the work that we've been doing in that context. So if we start to look at it from that perspective, what starts to become really clear is that, you know, the kind of the creation of runaway causal loops, which are nonlinear, the externalities that are generated, the short term optimization, the competitive decision making models between silos of governments and silos of partners becomes fundamentally uh, problematic in driving systems change. And our institutions, unfortunately, are geared to operating pretty much in the same way, in this way. So how do we start to change this? And often when we talk about change, change often focuses on new services, new collaborations, perhaps even a kind of social conversation. But actually the deep structures, the kind of evaluation metrics, organizational incentives, the financial incentives, the accounting structures um, become much more problematic. So if we're responding to these kind of uh, sort of, and I would call much of the violence that we see as you know, uh, not everywhere, but certainly as molecular, non-linear, non vis uh, invisible and micro threats, they're still governed by 19th century institutions that are no longer able to operationalize in that sense. So when we look at that, uh, that thesis, what becomes clear is that there are huge externalities being generated. And those externalities are not only to do with our current population, but also future populations. So um, if you look at all humans that were alive um, sort of uh, in the last 50,000 years, it's about 100 billion humans that have been lived uh, till now. And there's about 7.7 .7 billion are, uh, alive now. And if you look 50,000 years in the future with a kind of uh, with a conservative people, population growth, i.e. they've been uh, taping off of human populations, you're looking at over a trillion, trillion human beings over the next 50,000 years. Uh, so what that starts to talk about is what is our responsibility to not only the current generations, but also future generations? And how do we deal with the future risks we're generating for all those future generations? So how are we driving those externalities, both in terms of space and time? And the symptoms that we see around us, but, but underneath those systems are a whole bunch of structural issues in terms of actually our accounting, our governance mechanisms, our rights, our ownership structures, and our cultural stories that we've told ourselves, certainly from, from, a, from a certainly a Western perspective. And more and more, what became clear to us from a practitioner perspective was that actually the bureaucratic thesis, the governance thesis, the financing thesis, and the social norms were fundamentally actually a deep part of the innovation system, which was largely ignored, as we've largely been focusing on everything else, because it was not sexy to talk about these things, when actually what we're seeing is technology and other factors start to radically challenge this stuff. So company, company structures, the limited liability company has, has been born out of a very particular thesis of de-risking investors and actually uh, generating externalities on the other side, which are unaccounted for. It comes from a very particular thesis of power of coding of that capital in a very particular format, which accentuates that externality model. And it was born out of a very particular colonial mindset of when royal charters were given. Our financial accounting system do not account for externalities, do not price them in as substantive risk, even future risks. Uh, to those to those supply chains we're dependent on and are accounted for. So what you find is our current governance infrastructures and the procurement, uh, the incentives of single employees, employee contracts, these all are creating a very particular worldview which needs substantive transformation. So when we look into this, I think what becomes clear for us is that you need portfolios, portfolios of change and portfolios of um, 
portfolios of innovation. So when you're looking at this stuff, it, there's no single magic bullet to be able to deal with this scenario. You need whole portfolios and you need to be able to operate from strategic risks to learning, uh, learning about how you manage those risks all the way to strategic investment points. How do you deal with that transition from going to kind of, in a way, failure to treat the risk of failure to treat to treatment to prevention to thriving? And those are different accounting structures of where the risks lie, where the opportunities lie. So when you start to look at these dimensions, how do we operate? And what do these portfolios look like when you, when you start to map them out? The question that it throws up right here and now when you look at this as a portfolio of change is that this is no longer if this was for mental health capacity in Stockholm what becomes very clear is that the mental health uh, sort of uh, uh, re, uh, sort of directorate doesn't have much control on all these factors so how do you drive change in a system where all these other actors are involved in driving those outcomes and uh, either laterally or through co-benefits or co-externalities co, uh, and that becomes a key issue so when you look at poor housing in, in, in the UK, actually what you realize is poor housing costs huge amounts of impact in terms of actually, in, ter in terms of what it does for uh, healthcare costs or million dollar blocks of work that happen in Chicago, where uh, Chicago and across the US where actually sort of the poor design of neighborhoods and other things was massively uh, driving penal costs and costs into actually sort of the penal system in the US. And people were able to understand those social costs and actually redirect that capital that would have been spent and extracted from those communities in terms of uh, going to jail to preventively invest in those neighborhoods. So when you look at those externalities, social impact bonds are a kind of poem of that future. It's not a substantive change. It's a fix. It's a problematic fix to a systemic problem where the future externalities and liabilities are not mapped. So we don't do the right preventative interventions to be able to support that. So if we look at these things, when you look at so the role of social investment and how it creates spillover effects, whether positive or negative, there are some really systemic implications. And this again maps out to, we did some work around the High Line and looked at some of those implications of how the High Line generated massive amounts of social value lifted around it. In fact, for the High Line in New York, which many of you would have known, is just 10, it would have taken 10 months to pay for the High Line if you just took 10% of the land value uplift associated. And why I bring that up is this is where social goods or public goods, uh, civic goods, create huge amounts of privatized wealth. And that requires a reorganization of value between these spillovers. And this applies to natural assets. So we're doing work around the role of kind of natural assets and trees. Again, you look at the trees in most, most of the mild, uh, misdeveloped economies around the world are, are chopped down after 10 years because actually the insurance costs and the maintenance costs outstrip. Uh, that outstrip uh, become too significant. Yet the environmental services value in terms of actually their contributions in terms of sustainable urban drainage and other things, including heat island effects is completely discounted. So we see them as a problematic resource rather than actually the asset to which they are. And how do you operationalize that? Now this operates all the way through our, our, our sort of our regulatory domains. And fundamentally, I think what, where I want to get to is that you start to realize is that making any of these changes requires substantive revisiting of how we govern and how we operationalize ourselves all the way from policy and governance, which is more complex, but all the way through to the kind of power and the nature of how we use it and how we operationalize it. Again, we're doing work around uh, sort of the role of uh, so fourth generation uh, sort of regulatory sandboxes, what they could mean, how you go regulatory sandboxes, which go outside the domain of startups and go beyond startups to include civil and civic activism. How do you change the test bed mechanisms? How do you train the oversight mechanisms? How do you build some of these things? And this operationalizes all the way through to how we perceive many of our much of our land relationship. So how do you perceive you know, nature not as a cost, but as a fundamentally an asset? How do we look at shared outcomes and co-beneficiary relationships into our accounting infrastructures? How do we go from pledging and maintaining to maintaining so many of these things? How do we use green infrastructure more substantively and look at the spillover values? But also this, I think, and this I'm coming to a close, is I think it also requires us to look much more deeply into our relationship with land much more fundamentally. And again, with doing a bit of work in Canada, looking, working with Satsang and some amazing indigenous leaders, looking at actually how do you create new treaties with land, which where the land itself becomes self-sovereign. And how does that change us from a property thesis, which is made largely a relationship of um, 
I would say, enslavement of land to a single person needs to actually a new relationship of being uh, being in treaty with the land and it's and the land's multiple uh, multiple uh, pluralistic provision that it provides. So when you start to look at many of these things, I think what becomes very clear in the role of future of government, I think we have to start to think much more substantively. And what becomes, yeah, we need to start to deeply reimagine it all the way from the future of public budgeting, what does the nature of our budgeting look like? There's work going on about how you go from uh, one year budget cycles to one to 10, 20 year to 50 year, 100 year budget cycles, recognizing many of these things all the way through to actually public intangibles. When you place, for example, the intangibles of, uh, of the health of a, of a city and the health of its uh, the education capacity of, of a city as a fundamental asset on the balance sheet, how does that uh, support new forms of transformation? How do you build the horizontal capacity for innovation across city capabilities? Not where collaboration is just a nice to have, but collaborative outcomes become fundamentally the nature of how we deliver much of our change. And I think the role of horizontal organization will become have to become much more systemic in, in terms of the process uh, that we allow for. How do you build a real-time policy architecture to support the experimentation that's required? How do you build the kind of new ways of seeing that are absolutely necessary to this future? So these sort of things, and again, uh, these open up into new ways of operating into that thesis. So with that, I'll come to an end, and hopefully I didn't take too long uh, in that process, uh, Edgar, but actually as a, just a provocation, I suppose it's a, just meant as a gentle provocation for a whole bunch of conversations that we can all have together. But uh, with that, thank you for your time. Great, thanks, Indy. Um, so that is overwhelming to say the least. Um, so no, no, it's all good. But I think that that's the point because I think often uh, up until now, the conversation often is, you know, we need national urban policies. We need strong decentralization. We need to support local authorities and we then need to make sure these local authorities can attract finance so that they can actually solve the infrastructure crisis, at least within the African context as often how the debate is formulated. And I think what your um, wide ranging provocation suggests is that, um, that that can only be part of the story. But for the person who sort of has to think about this and works at the interface between uh, international institutions, international agreements and national governments and trying to support them to develop their own urban strategies uh, is our second panelist, Omar from UN Habitat. Omar, can I ask you to come in and share some of your reflections um, either independently on the work of UN Habitat or in response to India's <laughs> remarks? Thank you. Thank you very much, Edgar. Thank you, Indy, for this very thoughtful uh, presentation and philosophical presentation, of course. So we will try as much as possible to put it in the context of Africa. So knowing that, I think many principles that have been highlighted by Andy, especially on this deep code of innovation, are applicable to the context of Africa. And we can say there's even quest for those principles when it comes to national urban policy, bureaucracy, governance, finance, and social norm, where we have a lot of conflict between social norm and, and uh, statutory norm as well in the context of Africa. So I think those are some key points which are very interesting to highlight, uh, take into consideration as well the rapid trend of urbanization in Africa today. I think you can sorry say- Sorry to interrupt uh, your th train of thought. Ah, yeah, I was just asking you to put on your video so we can yeah. we can see Thank oh, you. Oh yeah, you can see me, right, right. Uh, yeah. No, yeah, yeah, I, uh, yeah, I was just saying, trying to localize, you know, this big principle highlighted by Andy, you know, on this uh, deep code of innovation, talking about bureaucracy, you know, governance, uh, financing system, social norm, with all this conflict, you know, happening between social norm and statutory norm, which is the heart of the process of urbanization in Africa. So as well, something we need to acknowledge in the context of Africa, of course, it's a recent trend, but uh, going fast, but meaning that uh, we are in the process of looking, you know, also construct for this urban factor in Africa, which is the best way of handling this urbanization. I think that where the aspect of policy uh, is very important, especially when it comes to national urban policy. So urban expansion, of course, I mean, uh, we talk about a lot on that. You know, the rapid trend, one of the fastest, you know, in, in the world now in Africa. But what I want to highlight, what is important to think about this policy length, you know, what are those key challenges they may drive the need of thinking you know, of comprehensive and integrated policy uh, to get to the point where urbanization can be a drive for transformation and structural you know transformation for africa as we are dealing with this you know african union uh, vision 
Yeah, one element which is very important in this fast track of urbanization, we do not talk about a lot uh, on that sometimes, but it's happening, is the increased secondary cities. I mean, the shift now of, of paradigm, you know, from big cities to secondary cities. So you can see in Africa now how many, you know, intermediate and secondary cities are emerging every day. And it is a sense, you know, of people looking for best place to be and others, but it can be a lot of challenges as well. So in, in, in Uganda, for example, some statistic has shown that uh, 70% of urban population are in the you know, secondary cities, which require a lot of services that need to be dedicated. But also, Edgar, in your presentation, you talk about the issue of capacity. Do they have really the capacity to establish a sound governance system you know, at the city level, but also to respond to the need you know, of, 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 of service delivery for communities, but at the same time, keeping the co territorial coherences between secondary and big cities is questioned as well which is the relationship between national and local government as well as I'm going to talk about in one of these principles of the national urban policy. Uh, and also we have all this element of pull factors and push factor as well for job creation and others, which is some drivers of transformation of the secondary city in a rapid way because people are looking for safe haven. The second point on this uh, assumption, I think, is informality as well, you know. I think that in Africa right now, 40% or 45%, you know, 70, even 54% in sub-Saharan Africa are in informal settlement. And it was come to informal settlement, I think the so COVID has teach us a lot from this way that we fail, you know, on addressing the issue of special planning and it's finding, a, you know, a, a balance between different territory in terms of access to basic services and different amenities, which is an issue now access to water. I mean, I've been shocked now. I mean, on the 21st century, if you see the mass of people in Africa doesn't have access to water and sanitation in the 21st century, it's an issue as well. I think, I mean, Andy has touched on the issue of land and security and security. I think this is a big animal in the room now in Africa in it's come to urbanization. We do not talk about it because it's very, very sensitive and very political and very uh, complex that sometimes we don't want to talk about it, but how you can succeed on sustainable urbanization, even on generating revenue and reducing inequality without touching the issue of land. I think many reform has failed, uh, including in Senegal on, on, on really looking into the lens, you know, of, of developing land for servicing, but also for make sure we are reducing the inequality. So in informal settlement, I think one key point now we are facing is the tenure security. And let's come to housing, one of the fundamental is making sure we have access to, you know, to servicing land. And that's the reason why as well in Africa, many, you know, policy on housing are failing because we do not manage to sort out the issue of land in terms of regulation, in terms of policy, but also in terms of social norm, where we have a lot of conflict between regulatory framework, but also social practices, as is happening many times. I think all this now will, will, will increase because, of course, Andy mentioned climate change, which is one element which is triggering a lot of displacement. But also one factor we should talk about in Africa, conflict as well, which is bringing a lot of displacement of population in cities now. I mean, in the Sahel region, you have a lot of concern now because people, I mean, basic services uh, and cities are under pressure with displacement of population. And this will increase and informality will increase again. I think that's the reason why we need to revisit our policy and see what are the best way we can anticipate. Most importantly, get the guidance and uh, for well-planned and compact cities and resilient, all the principles that are there, especially in the context of transformation, structural transformation for Africa and reduction of inequality. And we need to learn as well from COVID-19. I think that's the reason why to come back to this point of national urban policy, it's very important to see how this national urban policy can be a compass for decision makers, for city leaders in the way that we are running our cities and our town, which is very important. What is interesting, Edgar, I think now, the fact that at least there's a global recognition of the importance of national urban policy. I think from this declaration of Quito in the new urban agenda, it was clear that all member states, local government and national government agree that we need to have, you know, comprehensive and inclusive national urban policy that can help drive, if you want, transformation and change in cities and towns. But also we can see this national urban policy as an opportunity to monitor, you know, the SDGs. Those are some factors. But talking about national urban policy in the context of Africa and looking to these four principles highlighted by Andy on this deep cut innovation, I think four principles should be highlighted on that. So the first principle is the balance of power. I think you talk about devolution, you know, in your introduction, I mean, Edgar, where many countries are going into deep decentralization system. 
how to make sure there is you know power balance between different level of decision making and from covid 19 we learn a breakthrough or even if you want some caveat on this power allocation because we saw a lot of conflict between national government and local government on the way that even should handle this crisis it's come to resource allocation and distribution as there's so a lot of issues so i think it's a very important point we need to look at how this national policy can help you know regulate or also establish a good you know power sharing between different levels but also in terms of delivery of services and infrastructure building the second point from principle is citizen participation i think that's where the element of governance is very strong as well on this presentation because right now you have more and more strong you know requests from city, civil society you mentioned during your presentation edgar the issue of demonstration we are seeing in lagos uh, in dakar and in the covid 19 even those who have been out of the of the of the house was civil society, you know, to ask for you know the end of lockdown or access to basic services and others. And there's more and more quest for participation of citizens in the decision making. And this space has to be created and has to build on this principle of decentralization, of course, but also of building more stronger institutions in terms of de of democracy and citizen participation. I think some mechanisms and tools have been put in place through budgetary, you know, I mean, uh, what popular house call it, this participatory budgeting system, those are good tools. But I'm seeing now in Africa, the youth who want to play more and more role in the decision making. I mean, recently in Dakar, for example, during the flooding, I mean, there's a lot of decisions that have been taken by the central government and transforming some territorial transformation, for example, some area. And the youth was the one who was outside to say the government, we are fed up with this, uh, you know, with this flooding and we need, uh, you know, some uh, measures to make sure at least our cities is well maintained, but well managed, but also we have whatever we want in terms of, of sanitation and others. So those are some emerging things we need to take into consideration and use. In the cities, they can be, you know, a game changer as well, and want to play a key role on resource allocation as. And, and, and the force for principle is more about integrated and compact urban development. When it comes as things is governance and this bureaucracy, so we can see sometimes a lot of silo between institutions dealing with cities. And especially when you're in a country where you don't have specific minister dedicated, you know, to the urban issues, most of the time there is conflict. When we know that you know, uh, the urban fabric is an integrated place. All these pieces should speak each other, whether it is a finance, it is about land, it's about economy, social, and environmental should come together to speak. And also we need to go beyond the sectorial approach. So I think the national urban policy is game, you know, to bring all these stakeholders in the room, including even private sectors, local authority, to discuss the best way, you know, for engaging, you know, on this uh, key principle for sustainable urbanization in terms of urban planning regulation, mobility, energy, and as I think those are some elements as well which are very important. And lastly, as well on this uh, key principle, because I think we saw many practices in Africa where you can just see emerging norm without having a discussion prior to that. What I'm seeing, what I'm telling here is that the importance of having pol policy as the basis for regulation and the basis for taking, you know, different laws and others. So it's happening now, more, you know, slowly, but still, we have an old generation of law in the urban setting, you know, part of building code and others, which is not speaking to the reality on the ground. And I think that's where the conflict of, of norms are right now, statutory norm against the practices. And today it's very difficult to enforce all this principle on this law in Africa because people do not find themselves in those principles. How many uh, informal settlements, when you talk about informal settlements, of course we have our plan, we have our regulation, but at the end of the day, people are not following those patterns because they have their own thinking and their own expectation from the government. And it's good to look at, you know, this uh, pattern of legislation and regulation that we need to get into to make sure at least we have a legitimate and legal system that people can use, you know, to contribute to the, you know, to, to the development of cities. I think those are principles which are very important for me. But of course, as you may know, it's the work of UN Habitat on this national urban policy had been widely, you know, uh, acknowledged because we are working with City Alliance. Today in Africa, we have uh, more than 20 countries in support to development of national policy uh, to make sure at least they have good guidance and good direction on the way that we are managing cities and others, uh, you know, uh, common interests. But today, I think what is important is what could be, you know, the trajectory we need to take. And I think that's where, as well, the presentation in this very important. We have new context, which is uh, post-COVID. We can say we can be optimist on that. And they require new paradigm shift. What does it mean for Africa as well? Of course, does it require revisiting our policy? 
Does it require getting a new policy on the table, or does it require the full brushing what exists to make sure at least we are, you know, putting ourselves in the new in the new trend? But also the emerging issue that may require new regulation. I think we do not talk about that, but of course the intensification of technology of ITC now, the way we are using, does it capture all the legality required, or all this, you know, I mean, uh, all this, uh, you know, principles that need to be established in terms of regulation? I'm not sure we are talking about that. In addition to the issue of climate change, it is all that. Uh, I mean, all that uh, key point we need to look at. How do you want to move now with our national policy to make them more relevant? And adapt to the context. I may it may require a lot of decision, a lot of collaboration between research and practitioner as well to come on the table with key, you know, point point, point to, to help us local government. And this was our reflection I picked from this Andy conversation. Again, thank you very much. Back to you, Edgar. Edgar, you mute, huh? Apparently. Yeah, sorry, that's part of the, the Zoom game, right? Someone has to say that, and you kind of work at it. What, how far into the Zoom meeting does that get said? <laughs> so just doing my bit. Um, no, just thank you, Omar, for, 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 for that uh, overview of the work. And I think we are certainly encouraged as well by the fact that there seems to be a real political appetite for these national urban policies. Um, the question, of course, is how do we make sure that substantively that they, you know, that they they really get to to the difficult questions and that they're impactful. Um, so, without further ado, and oh yes, no, Omar. So I wanted to. I, I was thinking. I'm very curious. Are you Senegalese, right? Yes, I'm Senegalese. Okay. <laughs> no, no. So I was just very curious. Uh, not now, but in the discussion time later. You know, so yeah. what what do you do with something like Acon City? Like, what what do you make of that, right? Uh, so not to answer now, but okay, just to okay, say to the audience, <laughs> you know, that there's sort of uh, the speculative in, in yes, intervention. Yes, some dream, by, kind of dream. <laughs> yeah, by, uh, by, by the Senegalese American uh, pop star Acon. Uh, mm. And uh, the government gifted him a very substantial portion of land, as far as I understand. Um, yes. And the idea is that the kind of uh, version yeah. of Wakanda will be built and an Acon coin will be the currency for the area. And it has received an enormous amount of airtime in the commercial and mainstream media and business press and so on. But, you know, like I've been digging quite a bit and you just can't get to any detail. Like, how is this actually going to work? And, mm -hmm. but of course, the potential for it to have a... a, a a, uh, to distort the conversation in Senegal and planning and so forth in the city uh, is, I would imagine, is very high. I don't know for sure. But anyway, just later on, uh, you can scratch my curiosity and we can maybe give you your take and how as Habitat you would handle these kinds of speculative investments. But without further ado, Mark, the floor is yours. Uh, thanks. Uh, thanks, Edgar. <clears throat> thanks for... Um, the privilege of being part of this um, quite intense uh, conversation, which is uh, densely populated uh, with a set of concepts um, that reframe in a refreshing way old challenges and a whole range of new ones. Um, and I think at the center of, and, and this is uh, 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 this is happening across the board. I, yesterday I heard uh, two two presentations on the next on the upcoming uh, human development report by the head of um, UN, uh, the the person who has drafted the the, the report, and I heard a, another presentation from UNEP. <coughs> um, also about their latest upcoming report. And they're all reframing uh, all challenges in new ways. Um, and, 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 and I think, I think that, that's interesting, but it's a reflection of the times. It's a reflection of a certain tiredness uh, with, the, with, the, with the old narratives, um, which are normally about you know, roles that actors must play rather than processes and mechanisms uh, that different act, 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 actors can relate to in contextually specific ways and so on. So I think this is a good thing, but I think at the center of it um, is a tension between two words 
uh, which I which reflect two different realities, which is a theme that I explore in my, my new book, The Age of Sustainability. And these two words are complexity and directionality. And incidentally, Edgar, my center's name is the Center for Complex Systems in Transition. But as of today, we're changing our name. We're changing it uh, uh, because of an approval this morning by the university to the Center for Sustainability Transitions, which rolls off the tongue much better. But these, the two words are complexity and directionality. And, and really, since the 1970s, with uh, the shift from government to governance, as, as polities were decentered through the weakening of the state through neoliberalism, uh, we've, what we've left with when we think about governance is, is a relation. Uh, and you know, Bob Jessup has, has recorded that in the most successful way, and he's ended up with the notion that there is no such thing as the state. The state does not exist in reality. The state is, exists only as an idea. It's a political project. The state in reality is an assemblage, a ramshackle assemblage of a multiplicity of institutions which, inter, which interact with each other. Uh, and, and hence what he refers to as a strategic relational approach, an SRA, strategic relational, relational approach to understanding the relational state. Um, and that's really, a function of complexity. So as we decentered, as societies became more complex, as we built information technology systems to, to, driven by algorithms to manage the intersection points of, of our increasingly complex society, uh, we, we, our conception of change has, has, has become, uh, the, uh, has, has been provided by complexity theory, which is change is an emergent outcome. Now, if change is an emergent outcome of a set of complex systems, what do we do when we have a set of challenges that require us to head in a certain direction? Like, for example, decarbonization in the face of climate change. And so we have the second word, which is directionality. And can you reconcile complexity and directionality? I think, I think a lot of these new narratives really boil down to that. And for some who want to kind of resurrect social democracy 2.0 or socialism uh, 2.0, it's really about bringing the state back in, period, without problematizing what we mean by the state, uh, without really problematizing the probability that to bring the state back in, in the classic, uh, when you have in mind a, a, a classical state, effectively means attempting to reduce complexity. Now, when you start reducing complexity in very robust societies, whether those are African or, or not, you actually need quite a lot, you, you, you probably can only really do that with fairly significant amounts of coercion. So that's one option. Um, in other words, simplification through co coercion. And that's how you reconcile the problem of complexity and directionality. The other way is to say, no, um, we don't want to suppress uh, or reduce complexity. We want to work with complexity, but we also want directionality. And that really does call for us to start thinking about governance in a different way. And Bob Jessup refers to this as the governance of governance. Uh, and once he's established that idea that we, what we should be talking about is the governance of governance. In other words, how do you give a relational reality direction? He ends up with the notion of collaboratory governance, uh, which, which I've tried to elaborate within an African context. And collaboration is really a hybrid word that, that connects calibration, which is strategic reckoning, calibrate, uh, and collaboration. Uh, i.e. partnering. So strategic reckoning and, uh, uh, through partnerships or partnering uh, is really what collaboration means. So collaboratory governance uh, is, is, I think, a useful term when we start thinking about how do you bring the state back in, in a way that works with rather than against complexity. Um, 
and 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 what does it mean in practice? And so that's where I've 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 become really quite fascinated with the with the practices of of an of an organisation based in Cape Town called the Economic Development Partnership, uh, run by Andrew Borain. And this institution is really fascinating. It's a 2025 professionals whose full time job is to facilitate partnering primarily between public sector institutions, between different departments, between different levels of government. And they've developed a, a quite a specific, a specific language and, and, and sets of methods for facilitating these collaborations between public sector institutions. Yes, as well as with private and, and civil society, but the, the primary focus is, is, is to talk to the assemblage of, of state institutions and say, you can't talk about partnering with anybody else until you've got your own house in order, how you collaborate with each other. And they talk about the, the top-down authorizing environment and the bottom-up mobilizing environment and how do you work, uh, how do you create the kind of safe spaces that allows officials to feel safe because if they don't, they will refuse to innovate because the risks are too high. Uh, and then you just have a, a, a state that can't do anything um, of any significance. So, so, so what this, what the, for me this raises is that if you want to reconcile complexity and directionality, you've got to talk about collaboratory governance, i.e. the governance of governance. And, and the core skill at the center of that, which Jessup doesn't pick up on, uh, is facilitation, uh, the capacity for facilitating in complex environments where you need a stomach for uncertainty and uh, you, 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 you need to, you, you, you need to avoid the classic South African and African way of dealing with complexity, which is, oh, this is so complex, let's bring all the actors into the room and have a dialogue and hope for the best. There's that, 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 the, you know, the best that can happen is that you get a fairly high level representation in the first meeting, the second meeting, this next level arrives, the third meeting, all the kind of bait, the dodos arrive and you just achieve nothing. Um, and that kind of race to the bottom in order to reach for the top uh, inevitably results in paralysis. And, you know, that's not the way to go. It's about getting mandates for who participates, what are their objectives, uh, and how do you facilitate the dialogue in, the, in such a way that you're accountable uh, for the, the quality of your contribution and your levels of participation at the agreed levels uh, of, of, over time? So I think this, I think paying attention, if we're interested in, everybody says policy, 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 don't we have enough of that? Uh, surely we must, we must think about implementation. Well, if you really want to talk, get into implementation, you can't just keep on talking about implementation. You have to get into the granular detail about what this actually means. What's the nuts and bolts of practically achieving, of actually achieving something? And I think I'd like to maybe just connect that to another body of literature um, that that has um, that has got quite a long tradition. But the most recent is Matt Andrews's book. Uh, he's a former South African, I think based at Harvard now, and the book is called Building State Capability. And he does, he, he does exactly what I've been talking about, but it, and, and, and documents it uh, and uses a slightly different language. And, he, and his approach is called problem-driven iterative adaptation, where the focus is a very similar to the Economic Development Partnership in Cape Town is, listen, Forget your long term policy goals, forget your flip chart driven vision and mission statements. Uh, what are you going to do tomorrow? Uh, what is the practical steps that that you must take? And I think for me that that is what it means to be radical in the world today. The most radical person in the room today, in my view, is the person who says, what is the next step? And that's very different to the person in the, the, the what is usually regarded as the most radical person in the room, which is the person who says, listen, I know the fundamental contradictions of capitalism uh, better than you. Um, so so, so what, what, what is the next step? Is it the person who asks that question and takes the risk of answering it is the person who has the guts to step into the messiness. 
uh, and to work with what's there and connect the, connect the willing in, in the kinds of action coalitions that are iterative, adaptive, responsive, uh, and, and start, start building the kind of safe spaces for innovation, which uh, we, we, we desperately need uh, in order to, to, to begin to, to deal with these kinds of challenges. That, that does link, uh, and I, I liked in these uh, strong references to experimentation um, and, you know, experiment, I, I've been an experimenter for most of my life. And, you know, the thing about experimenters is that they're impatient uh, with the chattering classes who sit in front of flip charts with expensive facilitators and come up with visions and, and missions. Uh, but they need to also uh, recognize the necessity for, for, for futuring. Most futurists are very, very impatient with the with the present that experimenters work with. Futurists t hate the present. They see the present as this burning platform between the past and the future. And you've got to get off it as quickly as possible. And so they really only like talking about the future. Um, and that's not much use either. So somehow this futuring experimenters, experimenting futurists is the kind of radical incrementalist that uh, I think asks the question, what do we do next? Thanks, Edgar. I think I'll stop there. Thanks, Mark. It was fantastic. Um, so, Indy, I'd like you to maybe, before we get to some of the questions in the chat, uh, um, given sort of what Omar was saying, um, and given and to kind of out you as an architect, um, as a spatial practitioner, I thought I'd be curious what your thought is uh, in terms of the role of planning and spatial imaginations, in terms of the suite of regulatory retooling that you were talking about is there still a place for planning to put it in in its broader sense you know as in uh, sort of thinking about spatial parameters and grounding um, and since this issue of of land was also surfaced by Omar as one of the as well, almost one of the taboos within the African context and of course apart from it being a, a very complicated issue there's also multiple uh, uh, forms of authority that intersects with land, particularly traditional authorities, is a very important part of the landscape in many African cities, uh, and certainly in the secondary city context. Um, and then, um, yeah, I mean, obviously it'd be great, I think, uh, if you could just uh, reflect on some of Mark's comments, because they were clearly a direct response to, to your reflections. And Sue, uh, I guess in sort of where Mark ended up with the facilitation point, um, and the importance of that and the, the, the art of establishing a common ground of where people can, uh, where there's clear mandates and accountability. I guess what I'd like for you to come in on later is, is what is the place of data and evidence and knowledge to, to structure that common ground uh, in some way to make the facilitation meaningful and possible. Um, Indy? Yeah, um, thank you, Mark and Omar. That was a fantastic um, uh, sort of conversation starter because, so uh, I suppose where I, so a few, few reflections, I'm gonna probably work backwards. One is whilst I think, Mark, I agree with you around the plurality of government, i.e. there's not just one state, but multi, multiple states or multiple publics. The, the unfortunate problem is I think we're seeing through a combination of social media and accountability and other mechanisms, state becoming massively singular. So the tendency is actually driving responsibility and risk. You know, if, if an education system fails, everything goes up to the prime minister. It doesn't even go up to the school. It goes right to do it. So we're seeing massive singularity at the, whilst we need to drive kind of in a way the plural state model, because I think the distribution of the publics is a greater recognition, it's an, uh, both a recognition of the reality of what we need, but also what we need to uh, support. So I think that's a really, so how do we enhance that plural, plural state, the multi-state perspective, I think is a real design problem, i.e. the current system is currently going one way. Second, I think the kind of, so, in the work that we're seeing, the kind of deep code conversations is a to a, to a degree, a kind of response to the governance of governance. In a way, the rules of accounting, the rules of land uh, the property rights, 
the rules of actually incentive systems, the management system of the state, i.e. silo models. These are mechanisms which create effects of how we govern and how we operate. So in a way, the innovation that's required around that. So budgeting is a really good, good example. So um, like I was saying, the example of trees, trees have massive outcomes to actually whether it's actually sustainable urban drainage uh, risks or whether it's looking at heat island effects and future energy demands or whether you're looking at uh, CO2 impl implications or air quality and health implications. So what you see is that actually all those other departments need to somehow be willing to contract and to build these new types of civic assets. So one of the work, you know, one of the works we're doing with multiple cities across Europe is how do you build and finance uh, urban forests? Urban forests, which are actually multiplus in terms of the value they generate, both in space and time, beyond the single department that's typically responsible for them, which is i.e. your public to public accounting structure or contracting structure. How do public to public contracts occur to create value in different formats? So I think that's a that's a key dimension. I think that's exactly what we're seeing in a simplistic terms on, on say, even as simple as trees and solving the kind of um, how do you plant a million trees as they're wanting to do in Milan. And then I think the kind of, uh, then it really gets into the final point, which is, uh, which really links back into your planning conversation. In a complex environment, if you don't want to use coercion as a device, you have to create somehow um, greater distributed innovation agency, whilst that innovation agency has to be conscious of its interdependence. So I think that to me is the real strategic challenge is that we have to build greater distribution of innovation capacity, almost as low down as possible, whilst building the consciousness of our interdependence to the externalities we generate. And that to me is a structural governance conversation which actually allows for uh, us to deal with complexity because I think the worldview, as you rightly say, is that the complexity is increasing and our externalities are generating that. So if we were to take that say into our planning system, which is still largely centralized, what does that mean in terms of our worldview and how we construct that worldview? And I think that starts to open up some really challenging conversations around the role of informality. And you know, I, I slightly, I slightly worry about the word informality because I kind of almost want to accept. So I mean, like it was in Zimbabwe when we were there, it was pretty clear that once you start taxing WhatsApp, uh, WhatsApp trading, um, actually this is no longer. What do we mean by informality? Is it non-state? Uh, overseen economics, and I, I when ninety percent of an economy is informal, I think it's it's the wrong way to look at the world. Um, so I think one one of the things we need to start to reimagine is that that relationship of what is informal and informal. Is, maybe we should be talking about emergent in a, uh, emergent responses versus kind of state driven responses or centralized responses, and have a new compact. And how could you create the decentralized governance? to support those emergent responses. And I think that's about greater accountability. Like I say, the private limited company was a mechanism of shielding those externalities. So it allowed a private limited company to harvest value, but not hold on to the accountability of what those future costs could be and future liabilities were. So how do we change the authority of someone who is building actually locally to say, okay, we, you are allowed to do this, but on the basis that you consult and openly engage this process in a different way. So how do we build the decentralized capacity for innovation I think is going to be one of the key things when we're operating at such a radical transformational level. Because in order to deal with complexity, I think that's going to be one of the big issues that we see. That also throws up, I think, the bigger question, which is that, you know, how do we deal with infrastructure-based investments which operate at a different life cycle? And I don't yet know. I wouldn't claim to op uh, sort of be able to think about what that means in terms of actually 50-year cycles, 50, 20 years. 30 year cycles, which require a different form of thinking about the future rather than the emergent response. And I think that might be a different type of relationship between budgeting, which is one year between 50 year and 100 year budgets and what are the consultation or participatory processes required to achieve that in terms of giving that civic legitimacy. The final point I would just say is that I think what's becoming clearer from a lot of the work that we're doing is that actually the ability to construct this, this kind of the civic contract or this, uh, the kind of a the civic contract for change is now as critical as the mechanisms or the supply side innovation. There's a lot of work done on the supply side innovation side of what change requires, but I think the real challenge is on the on the, the demand side. So I think it was a Danish politician who said 40% of people in my constituency are going to lose as a result of 
any interventions on climate change, I have uh, I get voted in by 20% of the population. What, what, what do you think I should do? And it was a very crystallization of politics. Um, and so the question was, how do you drive change? How do you build political constituency? And I think the role of building political constituency has to go from what I would call just political opinion orchestration, but through the role of deliberative capacity for change as well. Deliberative conversations form and build different decisions. We know this. Opinion harvesting generates different decisions. So I, uh, the other part I wonder is whether we've got the right democratic frameworks to be able to build the deliberative frameworks that are required for change. The final point I just wanted to build was one of the kind of Western toxic thesis on governance that has become problematic is the idea of the strong state. And that is a toxic thesis because actually what's become more and more clearer is the strong state was only a powerful thing for extraction of value. So by having strong regulatory regime, it allowed for the extraction of value by international organizations that gives security for external capital to operate in subs. What China discovered and Yin Yang talks about very well was actually, it wasn't about the strong state, it was about the distributed ambiguous state, which allowed for emergent innovation, which created local contextual responses that were appropriate for that, that economy and place. So I think I kind of wonder whether we need to be talking more, more creatively about the role of the ambiguous or the gray state and the role of uh, dynamic innovation, which is what uh, China's response wasn't about Yes, it was massive centralization in one aspect, but massive decentralization of regulation and rules in an emergent format. And I think that's also a conceptual reframing of this conversation, which I think is critical. Thanks, Indies. And I think that's a great segue to some of the questions in the chat. And the first one uh, that I just want to lift out is from Jennifer Robinson. Um, Great points here from Indy, but I'm not convinced that it is modern archaic institutions which need to be contested. As the UK or the US established private sector corporate state alliances, defunding state institutions and inventing formats for reducing and delegitimating welfare claims, including detonating processes of managing the built environment and so on, I wonder what the institutional dangers are for any future transformation of African institutions beyond the modernist inheritance. Are these kinds of disrupted institutional capacity and organization already shaping African urbanization? Um, so maybe just uh, to note that, and then a, a comment from Anton Cartwright, um, and how, do, how to internalize risks that are highly subjective and not pronounced on by markets. Um, people value the future very, very differently. I guess, India, that's a direct response to, to your point. And then um, Lene LaRue raised um, a, a set of issues with regards to property being seen as a commons or treaties. To what extent do you find institutions, for example, banks, local government, and so on, willing to adjust property valuation systems that changes how land is valued, i.e. not only for financial gains, but for social value they offer? Can the property market be transformed to see the value of communal urban living? Um, so on that question, I wonder, Mark, since you've done some work on the commons in your recent book, and Omar, you've done quite a bit of work on, on land markets as well. You two may want to pick up on that, and then Indy, if you want to pick up on the other question. And then I think there was sort of a general institutional provocation from Dom Cox on this question of the form of the state and where whether we shouldn't be asking whether the nation state is actually the problem and obsolete and that the institutional horizon we should be looking at the city states uh, and the, the the role they can play in accelerating a completely different mode of organization i guess so um so those are sort of four quite heavy questions uh omar and mark do you maybe want to pick up on the land issue first um yes. and uh, and then um uh, we can swing back to india and sue if you want to come in feel free I mean, thank you, thank you, Edgar. I, I like the point raised by Andy on the concept of informality as well, as we are talking about in the context of Africa. Uh, it is a valid question because we see a lot of dysfunctioning of our institutions today because it becomes the model of state we inherited, you know, from the colonial system. And this model, I think that's, you know, something which has been imposed. And as we know it in many, you know, contexts and many 
activities of uh, democracy in Africa, we can see this influence. At the end of the day, we miss this, uh, this social part as well, which could be another you know, foundation. And that one problem as well, we need to look at how we want to shape and how we want to construct our cities and building on the inheritance you know, that, we ha that uh, Africa has from his culture, from his conception, and from his belief as well. That way, I think I fully agree with you, because at the end of the day, informal becomes something normal, because where you have 70% of your economy generated by informal economy, and the former is not producing as such, so you may ask a lot of questions. I think it's more about construct of the state nation that we inherit from the system, and that where the question is, you know, fundamentally now, which model, you know, of state we want to establish, of local government we want to establish, building on this, you know, strong inheritance that uh, habitat, uh, no, you and I, I'm so familiar with UN habitat that Africa, you know, is looking. And this is related to the issue of land as well, the same issues, because if you look at the, you know, the generation of policy after independence on this land sector are more, you know, uh, inspired from the civil system and should not capture, you know, the local context in terms of governance, in terms of societal organization. That's the starting point of the breaking point, you know, on this particular issue of land. At the end of the day, we have many uh, reform in Africa, but they have been taken to hostage by practices, by tradition, as you mentioned, Edgar, on your analysis, and you have the customary system. Up to now, Africa is dealing with this reconciliation between custom and system and formal and, and statutory system. And only a few countries succeed to make it happen. Maybe Uganda now with their national policy, you can see now they recognize this uh, form of uh, you know, traditional tennis system as part of the legal framework, which is a good progress. But as they completely deny it, and they just want to extract it from this uh, local reality to another one. And that's the reason why now, if you go to many countries, registering land becomes an issue. So you go to Senegal or other country, how part of the land is registered is under the cadastre system. Because people do not have this habit of going there and asking for protection of their right or of their land by the formal title. And this is an issue without counting the cost that this is uh, you know, involved as well. The most expensive. At the end of the day, the cadastre system is just for the elite in many countries in Africa. So, if you want to break this, you know, this this dichotomy, I think so. We need to look at the way we reform our land. What type of uh, land policy they want, and how to make it, you know, inclusive and participatory to make sure at least all this reality I take into consideration. Because right now it's a big loss for Africa. Huh? I mean, it's a big loss because land is not generating the level of taxation or revenue should be generating. And right now, in many countries, many cities, if you go. Uh, investment are impeded because of conflict around land or the lack of, you know, of clarity on the tennis system. So I think there's huge uh, work that we need to be done. And now we are talking about land value capture. We are talking about land adjustment. As all this may not be possible because of the regime of land we are dealing with. That. So my recommendation is looking into this uh, reconciliation between legitimacy and legality is very important. And that is the niche for Africa for me, because we cannot deny the traditional mechanism and we cannot deny as well the formal mechanism because it's already there. But what are the hybrid system we want to promote and some countries are looking into? And I think this generation of policy that uh, African Union is promoting is going to this direction of looking, you know, consensus among community on the way that we're going to generate land instead of imposing rules and regulation from the top. So over Edgar, yes. Thanks so much. Um, Mark? Mark? Did you want to come in or not? Well, not specific, not so much on the land question, okay. but I had to... Yeah, yeah, if any other of the questions that were raised that, or any of India's responses. Yeah, I mean, I think, um, I, I, yeah, I, I found India's comments extremely, uh, extremely fruitful and very, <coughs> very useful, um, uh, especially uh, a, a way of, of kind of framing this, this the kind of, Plurality of publics. I, I think that that's uh, that, that's that's I think very rich. And um, and uh, one of the themes that I I, I explore uh, in 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 my book is the way in which the commons uh, is 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 metamorphosizing into a, I think quite a useful con concept. So. Going back to Eleanor Ostrom's um, critique of the tragedy of the commons by demonstrating, um, you know, the, the millennia-old uh, 
institutional configurations that humans have evolved in order to manage the natural commons in particular. So, so her focus was tangible resources, natural resources, and how humans have collaborated uh, rather than competed and destroyed the commons, a la the tragedy of commons thesis. Uh, what's happened to that notion is with the rise of information and communication technologies, the, 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 the exploration of what the zero margin cost society means. And Paul Mason has taken that uh, quite far in his book, Post Capitalism, by uh, suggesting that uh, what's starting to be enabled is um, a multiplicity of new economic forms um, the peer-to-peer -peer foundation um, uh, somebody called Bowens and others have have taken that very far and are suggesting that um, information and communication technologies enable us to collaborate in ways which have never been possible before we can now collaborate as if we are a small group in large numbers on a global basis. Uh, and that's never been possible before. The, the only way you massify in, 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 in previous eras in the industrial age has either been via the state, in i.e. a bureaucracy takes an idea and massifies it like public health, or uh, through the market, um, like the motor vehicle. Um, and, 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 and then and Matsukato comes in and suggests, well, actually, the state always uh, intervenes to, 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 to create R&D and to reduce risk in the early phases of the innovation cycle. But well, what's emerging now is a vast multiplicity of institutions, even on a global scale, like uh, Wikipedia, Mozilla Fox, uh, Linux, Apache servers, many other large-scale institutions, but a very common institutional form where labor is in the commons. Innovation is loaded into the commons. And uh, that collective knowledge, like Ostrom's natural resource, gets downloaded uh, to the users in a way that they then use um, uh, you know, in, their, in their social enterprises. And the argument, this is a new mode of production. Um, and I think I think I think it is something I think it's something worth exploring in societies where neither the market or the state are going to deliver uh, what we look for on scale. Um, so uh, I think it was Edgar you once gave a talk at the book launch uh, where somebody asked a question. You know what what's new uh, about the youth? On, in, in African cities. And you said they're a generation of hackers. Um, they're basically stealing on a massive scale intellectual property, re, remanufacturing those ideas and deploying them uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in incredibly sophisticated low-tech infrastructures meshed together with new hybrid cultures in a way that's giving rise to, to new social and economic forms. And, um, I'm trying to make sense of those, all of that through this idea of the commons. Um, so I very much doubt we're going to, in the African context, evolve the commons, because it's not even a language in our, in our context. Uh, it's, 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 I'm, I very much doubt we're going to evolve that narrative, but also reality in a similar way to how it's evolved in the European context with a long tradition of cooperatives and so on and so forth. Uh, it's 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 going to be different, uh, and, and I know your work is is is, is thinking about those issues. So so is mine, uh, and just those crossovers and hybrids that are much more in the using information technology in ways that create a whole new set of hybrids that could actually massify and and create a space for innovation, which has never. Uh, yeah, there's a lot of innovation. Innovation is a way of life on the African continent, but it's, but it's, it's almost privatized. It's not sufficiently uh, coagulating into large scale uh, modes of production. Thanks. Um, Sue, did you want to 
pop in here or a few yeah, thoughts? If you can write yeah. A yeah, quick please. I'll come back in, in some summary later. Mm. But um, mm. I just wanted to note, I mean, I think what's so fascinating about this conversation is it is of a nature and a kind that could not have been imagined 10 years ago if you had convened a panel on to discuss the African city. Um, and I really welcome that. And I think that there are a whole lot of really interesting and new things that we are putting on the table. And as I'll come back to try and say a little bit more about what I think those are and where that takes us at, in, in a few minutes time. But I do just want to say, we've got to be very careful that we don't forget some other fundamentals. Um, and I just want to put two words on the table, gender and patriarchy, um, because you cannot talk about Africa uh, and you cannot talk about the past, present, or future of the African city without engaging uh, very substantially with those ideas. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, yeah uh, and on that note, I mean, one of the points I wanted to also just flag earlier when we were talking about the governance of governance and rethinking the nature of politics, uh, it seems to me that there's, and you know, in India, I'm kind of raising this now because I'm curious in your work if this has come up, is clearly the political party in and of itself as a form is deeply problematic and connected to the form of, um, of statecraft that you critiqued earlier, right? And so how do we, you know, sort of, what's the intersect with, with building a different narrative for what the function and the role of political parties might be, especially since of course, multi-party democratic frameworks are extremely recent in most African countries. You know, we're talking 25, 20, 25 years. Um, and uh, yeah, so, so, so just to sort of, uh, I think connected to Sue's provocation um, that where those two features manifest probably most, vis most viscerally is uh, the functioning and the power of the political party in the modern African state. Anyway, Indy, so a few thoughts from your side and then yeah. quite brief if you have any, and then I'll ask Sue to come in with her reflections. That'd be great. Um, yeah, just a few, th a few things. I, I suppose, um, I think the, the, the party system and our democratic system was constructed in symbiosis with our industrial age. So it created a centralization of power in order to deal with us our ability to plan, project, and organize the world. So it's a symbiotic relationship between an economic thesis and a governance thesis. It's largely an extension of still a kingship kind of model. The other thing worth recognizing is our management theory thesis is still a linear extension of militarism. Most management theory extends out of command and control theses out of that linearity. So there is a kind of structural question and that 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 we do need to open up reinvention of our thesis of governance and statecraft at a fundamental level. And I point to deliberation because I think deliberative democracies fundamentally produce different conversations. So that's, and they put different opinions in different forms of forms of, because I think they construct the conversation fundamentally differently. I also wanted to pick up, uh, I thought uh, where Mark was heading was really important, which is a trajectory of this stuff. So for example, I'm gonna run a quick hypothesis pathetical exercise. Imagine land was no longer able to be equity owned, but could be perpetually financed. So a perpetual debt instrument is what we're looking at. Um, so a perpetual debt instrument is really interesting because what it does is when especially it's owned by the land itself, it means you remove capital gains from the idea of land itself. It becomes almost like a community land trust. But uh, so Instead of, um, so for example, a house in Notting Hill in London was, you could buy a house in Notting Hill for about 7,000 pounds in 1970s. If it was financed through a perpetual uh, smart, perpetual bond, that's 7,000 pounds for the house itself. You're not financing the individual, the house itself. It would still, you would, to cover that debt, you would be paying 200 pounds a month in 2020. So land thereby doesn't accumulate value for a third party. It becomes effectively an infrastructure provision to unlock that. Then the benefits of land, so let's keep going with the hypothesis, that if you had that piece of land and you wanted to share the value of it, the land was releasing tokens. That if you farmed that land, if you created value, you would share some of that land into an automated wallet, which would maintain that land in some fashion, and you would get the benefits of it. But that's about distribution of value, not about wage. Uh, 
So suddenly what's a, what a new governance paradigm is opening up is a new thesis of governance, which actually automates that. Now that automation of governance and operational management is where the problem is and the opportunity is. That machined thesis that I've just laid that line, outlined there, which I think is not an, a future possibility, but is a near possibility, some of it is already manually being done, is that that opens up either a mechanism that can actually become a mechanism of lock-in, privilege and power buried into it through various rights and how you construct those rights and responsibilities, or it can become effectively an opening up of value creation and the distribution of value creation in different pathways. This is where the coding of these institutions, these micro institutions becomes really critical. And more and more what we're seeing, so we're doing a piece of work, for example, of looking at farmland and how do you incentivize the restoration of soil on that farmland, which you can do through actually satellite, satellite monitoring, uh, sovereign wallet, which is actually like a sinking fund for that land and the pricing of, of, of the goods that go out of it, no longer involving state, but a new micro governance infrastructure that sits around that land. This moves us away from the state as the mechanism of providing governance and distribution of externalities to that being micro constructed. But the construction of the norms and the principles of that have to be coded at a collective societal level. Otherwise, this will become a mechanism of massive extraction of value and exclusion. And this goes back to the first point that was being made about what are the risks in this thesis. I think there are many risks in this thesis where the privilege will very easily be coded into many of these futures. And I think that requires a new type of conversation, which is what I think what we're trying to have. And also recognizing governance mustn't be the lowest common denominator conversation. One of my biggest problems with many conversations not here is that often governance is reduced to being what I would call the simplest problem. Let's solve the simplest problem. Whereas actually what that means is those that are privileged with power and money will actually deep code us in much more structural senses from, through capital in a very particular way. So I think that's just bearing that in mind, it's quick reflections. Of, sorry, I took too long. Too long. No, no, it's all great. Thanks, Indy. And just to say that uh, sort of uh, echo from Jenny in the comments that what you were talking about, uh, there's, there's a version of that already in operation in Switzerland, uh, the Swiss Co-ops. Uh, Sue. Yeah, thanks, Edgar. And thank you, colleagues who are in the participant box. And so you can always see who's there when you scroll and that's always fun. Um, I wanted to make some comments on today's session, but actually to try and use it as a platform for thinking more generally um, about the intent, if you like, um, of creating a common narrative um, about Africa's future, Africa's urban future, Africa's urban revolution, whatever you want to think of it as. Um, and, and in a way, I think that the point for me is actually not so much to stop at the point of commonality, which is where what you, you said of the objective for today. Mm -hmm. But I think in fact, what we need to be able to get through through conversations like this is actually not just a common, but also a compelling and a clear narrative. Um, in other words, so we need to create a platform where we're able to have a dialogue, um, have discussion, debate, dis and, and, and dissent. Uh, but with the purpose of intent and application, Mark's point about implementation uh, rings very, very strongly. And I think we've, we've done some things right here, and then I want to end on something about where I think we need to go to. And it seems to me that the first thing that's been really impressive in this convening of the reframe is that it has brought together credible leaders and credible thought leaders. Okay, and now that's because they come from different places, they speak with authority from practice, they come from institutions and, and from creating institutions like Omar over decades, where people actually know the places that they're talking about, they know how they are run, and they know many of the dysfunctionalities of it. So legitimacy seems to me to be really, really important. And I celebrate what the reframe uh, program has done, because I think what it has demonstrated to us is in fact that there is sufficient capacity. Uh, we may not, we may want more, but we, the, we absolutely have more than enough to get on with it. Um, and I think that that um, is, is, is really important. What I think it does, however, demonstrate though, is that we're only just beginning to get to grips with the kind of deep expertise that is required for an incredibly highly skilled conversation of this nature. You've got to know quite a lot. 
the starting point is actually the level is quite high. It means that we need to be creating really significant intellectual and operational expertise to deal with questions of complexity. And I think any complexity scientist would say that anybody dealing with organizational complexity would say that when you add in Mark's provocations about getting both complexity and directionality in Mark, I thought that was really useful. Then you really do need very serious expertise. And that requires the ability to think with evidence. It requires the ability to think with um, very conceptual agility. And I think there are lots of examples of that coming out of the African context um, and, and more generally. And I mean, I think in fact, your, your ideas about deep code translate very well to the African context where the state is of many states, but and the codes are, not, are often in parallel rather than uh, complementary in particular kinds of ways, but it translates. Somebody like Keith Breckenridge's recent work on the biometric state, I think has been really, really interesting at looking at the, or biometric capitalism rather, has been really interesting at looking at the way the construction industry, the banking industry interfaces with the urban development process. Uh, Liza Torelli's work on, on urban finance and something like Kenya does exactly the same thing. So I think we actually are beginning to get to grips with ways of describing nuanced complexity um, and, and kind of understanding why that deep coding, to use it in an umbrella sense, not just in the way that India has done, is so important to the state of states, um, to the governance of, 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 of our cities. And that's not just a technical database kind of complexity. And I thought the examples that we used about politics and partnerships uh, were really, really significant in that regard. But for us to have the conversation about how those things come together, requires hard work, uh, quite wide reading, and an ability to harness back to a central object. And that's why I think we've got to keep this question in our minds of what's the, what is our object? What is the object of our analysis? And that's the question about urban change, about the nature of urban change. And so it means we've got to bring in new dynamics. And I think we've done it very well today, along with those older ones, hence my point about things like the enduring power of patriarchy. You cannot talk about land in Africa without talking about patriarchy. So, but that presupposes, and this is my next point, Edgar, is that I think what we have to be able to do then is to, we, we build this dialogue, we build this common conversation, which hopefully seeks to get to come kind of clarity and a compelling argument about the nature of urban change by drawing on a robust and flexible and deep institutional body of data, of analysis, and of theory. In other words, we all, people were invoking, I mean, I happen to be of a generation where we were reading Bob Jessup when I was a student, okay? But what do we do about the people who are coming into this conversation now who've never even heard of who's Bob Jessup? Why does this matter, okay? Um, at the same time as we'd be able to have really important old fashioned kinds of conversations about things like self-help housing um, and some of the debates that went on, on in those spaces. So we have to be able to begin to think about how do you build an intellectual architecture? How do we skill people sufficiently? And how do we make sure that we have the information and the databases that we require in order to begin to have the conversations that are necessary? And so it's with that that I wanted to just put something on the table. It's not the only way to think about it, but it's one that we have found really useful in the PEAK project as a way to begin to distill some elements of what are essential for preparing, I'm gonna call them knowledge leaders, thought leaders, practice leaders. I don't think you can do that without universities, but I don't think that universities, and I think the, the reframe conversations have demonstrated this absolutely. You need thought leaders from multiple sectors, people who are not so busy with their day jobs that they never get the time to reflect and engage. But what do we need from them? And it seems to me that the, the big project Peak Urban which you can look up on the web and just Google it and lots of the projects are, are coming to fruition. So you can have a look at it. The initial framing of that project is in fact, extremely helpful. And if you were thinking about, you know, what do you say to these national urban policymakers about what is required? What do you say to the ANU? What do you say to uh, the secretary general about what you're looking for from the study of cities? Um, and I think this is helpful at least in getting to grips with some of the core elements. Okay, and if you, you'll, it's, it's very boring, P-E-A-K, P, 
prediction, E, emergence, A, adaption, K, knowledge. I'll tell you what I mean by them, four things. Okay, first of all, it simply says we actually have to know enough and track enough about what is going on in cities and in the urbanization process to be able to say something. So I think what we've heard today and what is so refreshing for me is that it's not good enough just to know about how many informal sector sellers there are on the side of the road. We need to know details about land markets. We need to about, know about the regulation. We need to have an understanding of the way that the fiscal systems drive and don't drive uh, investments. So we need a range to, we need to be tracking things that we've never really tracked before in the context of urban Africa. Of course, we need to know how many poor people there are and whether poverty is going up or down, but we need to know much more than that. Okay, so we need to broaden uh, the brace of, of our, our predictive capacity, our tracking capacity, the P. We also, though, need to understand what the interplay is of those things. And India, I think this is the essence of what you were getting us to talk about. And that, that interplay is not just climate change interacts with everything else, which we sort of know. And yes, of course, that's important. But actually, it's the institutional mechanisms, the boring detail of regulation, the way that they've been put down, the way political parties invoke them, that we have to understand in their detail. Otherwise, you can't get to the Economic Development Partnership's operational sophistication in partnering the right people with each other. We have to understand the chemistry, the, cat the, the catalysts, the way they come together, that E. And then that takes you to the A. Uh, which, by which we mean the adoption of it. So once that stuff happens, how does it get encoded? And somebody said to me, give me an example of patriarchy. Well, patriarchy is a very good way of the way that power gets encoded in the city, okay? And it gets laid down in cultural norms. It gets laid down in formal legal institutions. It gets laid down in institutional arrangements and it gets laid down in physical construction. And I'm sure there are lots of other ways that it gets laid down as well, but that, the, the, the way that it becomes our practice, we can't change unless we know how it is now. Okay, so that's the A. So we've got to be studying those kinds of things in some, some detail. And then finally, we need to actually be sharing knowledge with each other, the K, P-E-A-K. We need, in other words, to be training that new generation. And I've already said a few things about that. I think when we begin to look at the curriculum that is given to the average engineer or the curriculum that is given to the average climate scientist. And then we let them loose in managing the most important cities. We think about actually the people who invariably come to the party with much more skill are people who come out of community groups who've got knowledge based on actual experience of, of, of working with social movements and with political processes. But we've got to, in other words, we think that knowledge system, and that means sharing in really interesting kinds of ways. And so, Edgar, I wanted to just end by saying I think ACC is playing in a really important role in this regard of convening these kinds of conversations. We don't always get it right. We don't hit all of the points at all of the moments. But I think the fact that there's been a set of discussions, the fact that they've related to very real policy processes, that they've interrogated them and not always accepted them, these are really important things. Uh, as we begin to move forward. And as we begin to start to mobilize amongst national governments, amongst funders, to begin to say, what do we need? Well, clearly what we need is in order to have robust, in order to have coherent, clear and compelling arguments about probably the most important sites of investment in our collective futures, actually, these are the sorts of, of processes which are really, really key. So thank you. Great, thanks, Sue. Uh, it was really helpful. And um, I'll pick up on a few of those points in my concluding remarks. Um, I'll just give the other panelists an opportunity to respond to anything you heard from Sue. And if not, we'll then shortly after that start to conclude the webinar. And I'll invite one of our partners to just share a few words. Um, yeah. So if any of you want to pick up on any of the themes, Sue, right, Omar? Yes, thank you, Edgar. Thank you, Sue, for this brilliant analysis uh, of this uh, conversation overall. I think there's a one point I'm really interested in, the way you pointed out as the internal discussion happening in the UN. What are we going to say to the SG office now on urbanization and others, how to raise awareness? I think this is something we are looking into as well at the UN. 
And uh, right now, there's a lot of interest of urbanization, but the data are very key to build this evidence on the importance and linking, you know, and the intersection urbanization with poverty reduction, you know, climate change uh, and crisis now. I think all these are of interest. And that is where I see, you know, some form of collaboration I already discussed with Edgar. For us, we are in the UN system. Of course, we are doing a lot of operational, but there's a lot of a gap and hole in terms of research in Africa on the urban sector. How we bridge this gap, you know, between university, you know, this operation and normative items, I'm very interested on that. And probably after this, we need to pursue because the point I'm putting in my office now, in the regional office, is not, it's not just about operation guide. This office should be as well a think tank developing innovation, new ideas to guide the policy and uh, development, you know, in the urban sector particularly. So looking forward to deepening this conversation over this. Great. Thanks, Omar. Appreciate that. Uh, Mark, any final reflections or thoughts? Well, uh, I, I want to maybe come back to, uh, to, to Sue's comment about the university. Um, and, uh, and possibly, um, I'm, I'm, I've been wondering about how we reinvent the university. And uh, I've been uh, reading closely and rereading and trying to teach uh, the work of Nlovo Gaceni on empire and uh, coloniality and colonial and, and decoloniality. De and um, and so it's, and at the center of his of his proposition is pretty much where Indy actually began his his uh, uh, his beautiful uh, presentation. Uh, the, the essence of his propos proposition is um, a concept of knowledge which rests on the on the notion of the universe uh, and the extraordinary attraction of the notion of universality. Of, of knowledge, which in turn gives rise to the notion of the university uh, and, and therefore the university as the institutionalized repository of that colonial form of knowledge, uh, which uh, Ndlovo Gacheni is, is criticizing uh, because of his insistence that we may have decolonization, but we don't have decoloniality. Um, and so for me, that really has given rise uh, to what quite a few people in different places are, are talking, are referring to as the pluriverse and the pluriversity. Um, and I've been advocating with obviously zero support within my own university that we rename Stellenbosch University the pluriversatility. <laughs> Stellenbosch it doesn't really gel. Uh, exactly, uh, unsurprisingly, but I think it's I think this idea of a plurality of publics that India referred to is really dependent on a plurality of knowledges within a reinvented set of institutions that should be called pluriversities, um, and uh, in in that way we kind of start turning knowledge on its head, uh, and and for me that. A key element of that would be to find a meeting point between what Sub-Saharan African philosophers refer to as ukama, the, the, the notion of relatedness to all things, not just Ubuntu, relatedness between people, but relatedness to people and nature and, 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 and the ancestors. Um, uh, this kind of relatedness to, to all things has got quite an interesting meeting point with where Western post-humanism is going, uh, the relational self. Uh, but as always happens in the West, that's, that's like a new discovery, whereas actually that was, relatedness was never really lost within the African context. So it's rediscovered, I suppose. Um, but that meeting point, uh, I think, is, is a very uh, productive space for, for for building on in our, you know, a few decades of work by people like Ashil Mbembe, Abdul Malik Samar, and Edgar Sue, and many others, uh, as part of this conversation, is what what next uh, for our way of the southern way of thinking about urban uh, as as a relational uh, 
and emergent uh, property, uh, especially in the context of this, this question of directionality and the capacity for facilitation. The extraordinary pluriverse we have to build in each one of our students to cope with complexity is, that's probably what keeps me awake at night. Uh, that's my dream, uh, how, how, how we build the internal pluriverse uh, in our students. Thanks, Mark. And just for those who are listening, uh, a good entry point to uh, the, the debates around the pluriverse is Arturo Escobar's recent book, uh, 2018, I think. Uh, so, Mr. Anti-Development. Um, Indy, a final word, and I'm going to do what they're going to do on Thursday with the American debate. You've got one minute and then I'll mute you um, so that we can finish on time. Fantastic. Um, so, I, so a few things. I think uh, what Mark was saying there around our relatedness, and I think our relations are to the future, are to nature, are to each other, and to the things we make. And I think all of those relations are being transformed. Second thing, I suppose it was an open question to both Mark and Sue, was prediction as a thesis. Can we operate with prediction as a language? Or do we have to operate with a new word? So could we invent a new P for you in that thesis? But which is because in complexity, we could have intentionality perhaps, but prediction is quite difficult. And maybe by not predicting and operating in an age of uncertainty, we need a new language. And I think I go back to Yin Yin Yang's work around, you can have intentionality of policy, leaving emergent responses, which you then correct and recorrect in an agile response. So like, I, I, just to say a few of those things, but I think I'm uh, deeply honored and thank you for inviting me to be part of this really important debate. I really appreciate it. Thanks, Cindy. Probability. So Probability. So before we get into P words, um, I'm going <laughs> to mute both of you and, um, and just uh, uh, invite uh, one of the partners who's walked the journey with us for quite a while, along with the Swedish International Development Agency, is the Alfred Herrhausen Gesholska. And the person who heads up the urban program and that I've worked with um, over the last two, three years is Elizabeth Mansfeld. And I'm just going to ask Elizabeth to share a few words uh, on the occasion of our last uh, webinar. Elizabeth, the floor is yours. Thank you, Edgar. I hope everybody can hear me. And some words on behalf of the Alfred Herrhausen Gesellschaft. Um, they might be repeating, but worse to repeat. ACC and the partners hosted um, a month of fantastic, really fantastic webinars to promote an, inf an informed debate and propositions on how best we can advance sustainable and inclusive African cities. And therefore, a big thank you to all speakers involved and especially to Edgar and his team who engaged over months to set this up and come back to us and uh, involve different speakers, different partners, and really a big thank you to Edgar and, and his team. And some words um, back to the road when we started. We started on a general approach on African cities, the urban transformation, discussed the sustainable infrastructure as key to success, civic power, and today we ended with innovative regulation. Great discussion today. And the discussion showcased numerous transformation processes these changes affect the economic, political, and social spheres and are accompanied with a growing African sense of communities. And these are, are expressed in the ambitious agenda 2063, consistent with international norms as expressed in the Sustainable Development Goals, the Paris Climate Agreement, and the new urban agenda. And within this field, there is seems also a considerable risk that we underestimate urbanization as a critical driver of development and fail to understand African urbanization dynamics. And to discuss these challenges and solutions of urban dynamics, the Alfred Herrhausen Gesellschaft and partners convenes decision makers from Africa and Germany and the European Union and established with the urban dialogues an informed debate and 
on urban Africa since 2018. And I'm sure that the reframe sessions, these urban dialogues were important and served as a critical resource for civil society and development institutions to forge common purpose and how best to engage political leaders in order to achieve policy change in the short and medium term. What's next, as mentioned, Mark, in the light of the postponed AUU summit, it is key that we continue the conversation to tighten a trustful partnership on all levels and stakeholders at the pan-African level between Africa and Europe and national and local levels. I encourage everyone to share ideas, activities and engage with others. As Sue mentioned, we need a platform for the dialogue. Peak is one. Be proactive to reframe approaches and continue to pursue ways which require a long press. Thank you, Edgar. Thank you very much, Elizabeth, and thanks for your support. Um, so I just want to also add a few other thank yous, and then I'll just make one concluding re remark on what's on what's next practically for us. Um, so as you know, we were trying to make sure that the discussion was anchored and oriented, and so we produced a primer for the series. And I want to just thank my colleagues, Liza Chiralia and Anton Cotright, who co-authored that with me. And we, again, if you haven't seen it, please go to the website. Uh, you can download uh, the paper there. Um, and then also Elizabeth has thanked all the speakers, but again, just to reiterate, we had 18 speakers across the five uh, events and a lively audience every single week. And that's been amazing. And, um, and then uh, specifically uh, Alfred Herrhausen and CEDA has financially ensured that we were able to convene this and we've had intellectual partners with Dark Matter Labs, Peak Urban and the Gothenburg Center for Sustainable Development. And that's highly appreciated. So what's next is that the five webinars are all on the ACC YouTube channel. Um, so that can obviously be downloaded or watched at your own leisure at any point. Um, we are also going to distill some reflections across the five sessions and produce a summary note uh, as both a record but also as a bridge between these events and what we hope to do into the future. So we want to specifically distill an advocacy strategy for next year. As Elizabeth mentioned, one of the key a sort of nexus points is the, is, the, is the macro conversation between the EU and the African Union on uh, infrastructure investment and urbanization in Africa. And we want to make sure that the deliberations we've had here engages with those processes, but there are similar processes within the AU, within various pan-African institutions and so forth. And secondly, um, we will try and curate different opportunities for de deliberation again, what form it will take, we're not sure. But at the heart of this is a fairly ambitious project where we think that um, various development finance institutions need to be challenged to put together the resources to strengthen African universities and think tanks to be doing the kind of evidence building and perspective deepening that we've heard in today's session. And so there's sort of a very detailed advocacy strategy under design and that will be enacted next year. And the hope is that over the course of the next 12 to 18 months, we will be able to announce some kind of agreement between the big infrastructure banks, uh, some of the big development agencies, some of the, the big UN agencies like UN Habitat and so forth, uh, that will speak to a sustained investment in knowledge production, capacity building around these questions. Um, as I said, that's the work that lies ahead and that's the practical stuff, uh, the what next we've got to do. Um, but the series has been absolutely essential to help us think through how to frame and how to sharpen what the messaging might be. So on that note, thank you very much to the panelists today. It was an absolute treat. Uh, I kind of feel in a COVID context that you were all in my lounge and we were having cocktails and just having a really wonderful spirited conversation. It was amazing. Um, so Omar, Indy, Sue, Mark, deeply appreciated. And finally, just my colleague Alma Vervias, who's made sure we hear every week, we recorded uh, and everything is documented for posterity. Deeply appreciated. Until next time. Ciao.
Thank you, Thank Edgar. You. In touch. Thank you. Thanks. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye, Thank Edgar. You. Thank you so bye much. Bye-bye. Thanks. Thanks. Bye. 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 bye.